Good evening, everyone. For those who don't know me, I'm Tanya Applin. I'm a professor of IP law here at the Dixon Poon School of Law. It's a tremendous pleasure to welcome you here this evening for tonight's lecture, and a great privilege also to welcome our eminent speaker and guest, Professor Pam Samuelson from the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Samuelson has had a very distinguished academic career. She graduated from the University of Hawaii in political science and history, and later obtained her JD from Yale Law School. She was a professor of law at the University of Pittsburgh for many years before joining the University of California at Berkeley in 1996 as a professor both in the School of Law and the School of Information. From 2001, she held the post of Chancellor's Professor of Law and Information before being appointed in 2005 as the Richard M. Sherman Distinguished Professor of Law and Information. Professor Samuelson has also held many visiting posts at leading law schools, including NYU, Columbia, Cornell, and Harvard, and has been an honorary professor of the University of Amsterdam since June 2002. She's director of the internationally renowned Berkeley Center for Law and Technology, and serves on the board of directors of the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the Electronic Privacy Information Center, as well as on the advisory boards for the Center for Democracy and Technology and the Berkeley Center for New Media. Professor Samuelson's scholarship has been both prolific and world leading. She has published extensively on matters to do with copyright law reform, information law, patent law, privacy, software, and digital challenges such as mass di digitization. And several of her publications have assumed canonical status in the literature. She's also led amicus curiae briefs in groundbreaking court decisions, such as the Supreme Court decision in Grokster. Personally, I found Professor Samuelson's work enormously helpful in my own research and teaching, and can assure you that there is a long line of King's graduates who have her articles, A Manifesto Concerning the Legal Protection of Computer Programs and Intellectual Property Rights in Data, imprinted in their memories, and some of the students are here tonight. Tonight, Professor Samuelson will be speaking about a topic of enormous importance, the copyright challenges associated with mass digitization of cultural heritage. Before handing over to Professor Samuelson, I want to say a few brief words of thanks. First, to the Dixon Poon School of Law for generously supporting this event, and second, to Gemma Noyce, who's in the corner, our events manager, for her fantastic organizational efforts. Without the support of the school and also Gemma's superb skills, this event would not have been possible. So without further ado, I would like to hand you over to Professor Samuelson for this evening's lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for being here. It's a great treat for me to be in London. And uh, when I volunteered to give this talk, um, I thought, well, maybe three or four people would show up for it. Um, so it's, a, it's a actually a great pleasure to discover that I'm not the only person interested in mass uh, digitization of cultural heritage issues. Um, so goodness sake. Um, so the vision that has uh, been important to my thinking about, uh, about mass digitization is this notion that has been around for a long time of uh, a universal digital library. Um, and it's been inspiring for many people for uh, many years. And part of the appeal about that is that knowledge can be democratized, and hopefully that will have many positive spillover effects, uh, not only for people's personal lives, but their professional lives, their lives as a members of society, uh, and many good things will flow from it. Uh, the universal digital library that can be uh, had now is one that can be available to hundreds of millions of people, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, and uh, much of the information that we have on the internet today uh, is uh, available uh, anywhere in the world for free uh, and seemingly forever. Uh, and so uh, this is a very inspiring uh, kind of image. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about the Google Books search settlement proposal, uh, which was a kind of 
uh, effort to uh, bring something like a universal digital library into uh, being. But before I get there, uh, for uh, many Americans, Thomas Jefferson's uh, uh, well-known statement that he who receives an idea from me reads, receives instruction uh, himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening mine. And this notion that we can share information in ways that will uh, enrich us all is really a very powerful kind of, uh, of image, and I, uh, I, uh, I subscribe to it. Now, there are many conventional impediments to achieving a universal uh, digital library. Very few libraries, the British Library being an exception, uh, and uh, the Library of Congress uh, also, uh, but very few libraries have the resources uh, to make uh, large collections available, uh, to gather together uh, large amounts of uh, uh, cultural heritage and uh, knowledge works. And of course, uh, even once you have a physical library, uh, you can only lend out uh, one book at a time. Uh, those books are vulnerable to damage uh, and uh, theft. Uh, and so uh, we see that actually access to knowledge uh, often is limited to certain patrons. Uh, times of day are limited. Uh, there are um, uh, expenses to maintain uh, these uh, digital uh, libraries. And um, very often, um, Although many people might have access to the library, the actual utility of the library is a lot less than the potential that might exist. But part of what I want to say is that uh, there were mostly physical impediments to achieving a kind of universal digital, or a universal library through these kind of uh, conventional uh, means. But um, copyright was a kind of invisible part of it. Uh, so in many parts of the world, um, libraries are free to lend out uh, their copies of works to members of the public. Uh, those books uh, circulate for a while, then they come back, and then they get recirculated, and that's really great. Uh, in the UK, there is a uh, a public lending right, so it isn't the case that every time somebody borrows a book that they have to pay directly for that public lending right, but there is a, uh, a value to society and to authorship uh, that uh, authors can uh, enjoy some uh, compensation when their works, in fact, are popular with members of the, uh, of the public. The internet, of course, changes everything. Uh, you hear this all the time. Uh, but of course, what makes it uh, especially potent uh, is that it's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and uh, it is uh, amazing to me, and it must be amazing to at least some of you who grew up when only conventional libraries were available, uh, how much information, in fact, is available uh, now uh, uh, for free, and again, uh, groups like the Internet Archive, uh, one of Brewster Kale, its founder's state statement is, this information that's in an Internet Archive is available for free forever, and that's a commitment that he's made, uh, and he wants to make that into a universal digital library, just like uh, some other folks uh, do too. So amazing that uh, there now is a sort of a, a forum through which a universal digital library could be uh, made available. And you see libraries all over the world wanting to mass digitize their collections uh, and feeling like that's something that's, that's part of their cultural heritage mission, which is to provide greater access to uh, the public of works that uh, were uh, available for um, uh, cultural enrichment. So you see the Europeana uh, initiative in the EU, uh, an effort to make uh, the cultural heritage of Europe available uh, online, uh, and you see the British Library engaging in mass digitization. When I checked their website uh, before giving this talk, they said, we've only been able to mass digitize 1% of our collection. Uh, but, you know, that's pretty good. Um, but more uh, is underway. Uh, and of course, we brash Americans have the Google Book Surge uh, corpus. And Hathi Trust, which is a digital library that's 
uh, that of about 10 million digitized books that is now um, a, a kind of pooling of copies of books that were scanned by Google from uh, research library collections, and I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a minute. The British Library has a nice, uh, on its website, a nice description of why it is that mass digitization is so desirable. Opening up collections to researchers, me making them available to people who can't physically get to uh, the British Library uh, premises is huge. Uh, creating also a critical mass of digitized content uh, is an enormous benefit uh, to, uh, to researchers. And part of the reason for that is because once you digitize works and make them available in a big corpus, you can do things, you can do kinds of research that was simply impossible to do uh, in the past. Uh, and uh, you can add value to uh, and open up uh, opportunities for uh, research that were unimaginable before, uh, and you can help to uh, reinterpret the content, uh, make it easier for people to discover things, uh, um, and preserve uh, unique, rare, and fragile items that now can be made accessible, which you wouldn't want everybody's grubby hands to, to get on, but can be made available um, electronically, and that's really uh, terrific. Now, if I was an American, of course I am, um, I would say remixes and mashups is another advantage of having uh, something like a digitized corpus. You can take things and you can remix it, you can mash them up, and that's actually another opportunity for new creation. A word or two about data mining. So I mentioned already that mass digitizing a corpus means that you can do kinds of research that were impossible uh, to do in the past. So if you imagine uh, all of the works in the British Library's collection being digitized, you could run one search across the entire millions of copies of, uh, of those digital books and yield back whatever historical figure, whatever historical event you were looking uh, for information about, you would be able to find every book in that collection that mentions that uh, event, that person, and you could get the title, you could get the contact information for it, you could even get the page number on which you could find uh, that book, and that means that you can do research that is far more thorough than even the most uh, uh, skilled uh, researcher is able to do just by knowing the physical uh, resources. So uh, on top of that, um, uh, people are, collect, are developing tools to do computational analysis on text that, again, opens up new opportunities for uh, research. So uh, especially in the humanities field, you kind of think, oh, humanities, they don't do anything like this. But actually, there's now a new field of uh, digital humanities research. Uh, and I saw actually a beautiful presentation by um, uh, a, a digital humanities scholar uh, who was tracing the influence of uh, authors such as Dickens and uh, Jane Austen by looking at the similarities between their works to each other and then the works of subsequent authors and who had the, the greatest influence is something that he actually wrote a book about and that's actually a kind of thing which again, we couldn't do any other way. And uh, bravo to uh, the UK for having adopted very recently an exception to copyright rules that actually enables uh, nonprofit uh, or non-commercial uh, data mining uh, as a legitimate activity. Uh, and so that's an enormously exciting uh, development. So what are the impediments to this mass digitization that people uh, want to do? Uh, obviously, it's still somewhat expensive to digitize uh, works, especially to digitize them in a quality that will allow them to be preserved over time. Uh, also, it's difficult and uh, expensive to try to migrate the digital copies uh, so that they last for a very uh, a very long time because, of course, as you know, uh, some of the 
this that you have stored things on a long time ago, they can't be read anymore. So we have to find ways to make sure that we migrate uh, the preservation copies. So it's, it's expensive, but boy is it cheap by comparison with the printing of physical uh, copies. Uh, and um, uh, and that, that for especially cultural heritage uh, institutions, libraries, museums, and the like, that digitization cost is non-trivial, but by comparison with before, it's actually pretty small, and of course, uh, it gets smaller all the time. Now, there's some technology obstacles, too, because very often, cultural heritage uh, institutions don't exactly have the highest of high technology expertise in-house, uh, and so one of the reasons why a lot of those, uh, a lot of those institutions are trying to make arrangements with technology companies is that they can bring in expertise, do the kind of cutting edge, state of the art uh, digitization project uh, that not only involves scanning, uh, but also uh, generation of the right kind of metadata, uh, organizing the right kind of database, uh, and, uh, and manipulation of the data uh, that uh, is desired by the, um, uh, by the people who want the stuff to be available. But copyright, it turns out, is a pretty big obstacle uh, to mass digitization efforts, too. Um, in the US, uh, works are in the public domain um, if they were published uh, after uh, 19, or before 1923. And so uh, that's a long time that we don't have uh, works in, uh, available in the public domain to be digitized. But, uh, the UK and the EU has life of the author plus 70 years so that it's really not safe to mass digitize works uh, that were created or published before uh, about 1870 is what I've been told by the tech companies who work on this. Uh, and so copyright is a big impediment because there are a lot of works that were created since 1870 that it would be really desirable to be able to get access to. Uh, and so uh, that's uh, the big obstacle that um, I'm interested in trying to overcome. Uh, so I have actually a slide, um, assuming that there's not uh, an entirely um, uh, copyright savvy audience, then maybe that's wrong, but um, uh, let me do the two minute version. Uh, so authors uh, have exclusive rights uh, in their original artistic and literary works uh, that uh, that, that right attaches from the moment of creation and lasts for uh, 70 years after the author's uh, life. Um, authors get exclusive rights to control reproductions of their works um, and adaptations, communications of them to the public, public performances, uh, and there are some exceptions and limitations uh, so that uh, in the UK, for example, there's a fair dealing right that allows you to make some private study uh, type copies uh, and some library uses are accepted, but mass digitizing uh, works in, uh, in copyright works uh, is not really something that there is a special exception for in uh, either UK or EU law uh, at the moment. So uh, why is it uh, an impediment? Well, there are these exclusive rights. Um, and uh, trying to track down all the rights holders of all the works, right, if you have a collection of 20 million books uh, in your collection. Um, clearing rights on all 20 million is going to be really expensive. Uh, and so the question is kind of how can you, uh, how can you do that? Um, it's going to be much, uh, much more expensive to clear the rights in the book than it costs the book uh, to, uh, to cost to buy the book in the first place. Uh, but what can you do um, uh, if you want to be uh, respectful of copyright, you've got to try to clear uh, those rights. And one of uh, my colleagues in the US was estimating that it costs about $1,000 uh, per work to actually try to track down the rights holder. And that doesn't include uh, any fee that the rights holder might want to charge for, um, uh, for enabling the mass digitization uh, to happen. Um, it's also sometimes unclear who owns the right to control digitization, because a lot of the works were published at a time under, uh, under uh, contractual arrangements where um, e-books uh, were not envisioned. And so 
it's not clear whether the publisher has the right to control the ebook version or whether the author, in fact, uh, controls the ebook version. And so if you really try to be safe, you'd have to do two sets of right clearances, one for the author and one for the publisher. And then that raises the problem of orphan works, right? What happens if the work, let's say, a photograph, uh, some sort of, uh, of image um, that you want to include in the mass digitization project, some photographs that are, in fact, incredibly important for historical research of, uh, let's say, World War I, um, you want to be able to make that. Uh, you want to be able to make some of the letters of the soldiers available uh, online. Uh, and what can you do? Well, sometimes you can't tell who is the author of the work. And if you can't tell who the author of the work is, then you're not going to be able to clear rights no matter how much you, uh, you search for the person. Uh, and uh, sometimes you can't find them because they don't exist anymore, right? They're, uh, they're dead, you don't know where the heirs are, the publisher went out of business, uh, and nobody seems to know where the rights went uh, from that. Uh, and of course, the older the work is, the more likely it is that it's going to be difficult to track down uh, the rights holder. So we have some options. What do you do? Well, one thing you can do is sort of say, well, gosh, a universal digital library would be such a great idea. But I guess we can't get there because copyright's a big impediment, and uh, so let's give it up. Um, it's hard to do that when you kind of see the dream is within reach. It's, it's possible now to do something that we couldn't do before, and it would be so beneficial that it's really hard to give up, at least for me, uh, on the image of trying to make this happen. Uh, what a lot of institutions, especially in the European Union, are doing is focusing their mass digitization efforts on their uh, works that they know to be in the public domain. Uh, and that's good, okay, but actually you want to not just say that, you know, Universal Digital Library lasts, uh, you know, kind of covers everything up to like 1870 and then it feels like a big gap. Uh, so uh, we got to sort of find some way to try to do something um, bolder than that. So Norway created was known as an extended collective licensing uh, regime uh, for digitizing the contents of the uh, Norwegian National Library. What this means is that a collecting society in, uh, in Norway uh, collects some money and then can grant a license to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the library to mass digitize everything in the collection. And if rights holders don't want their works to be in that digital library, they can opt out of it. But um, the legislature has authorized the collecting society to give uh, a license that includes everybody, unless they opt out, uh, even though the collecting society might only have this many members. And in fact, there are this many authors that's bigger than that. Um, and so an extended collective license is kind of a way to get around the rights clearance uh, problem up front, although then you have to sort of figure out how do you get the money to the rights holders that actually uh, uh, you collected the money for. So that's actually a, you just put off finding the rights holder, uh, but at least you collect a little bit of money from it. Um, another thing that you can do is establish an orphan works licensing regime, which at least increases the volume of in-copyright works that you can make available. Um, and uh, another option is to go ahead and mass digitize, because rights holders may not show up, um, and, uh, and rely on fair use in America, which is what we do. So let me talk. <laughs> it's true. Um, OK. So let me talk just a little bit about the uh, about the Google Books um, project uh, because it's the boldest of the mass digitization projects that has been undertaken. Um, it also, uh, um, uh, when it came to a settlement, uh, which I'll talk about briefly, uh, it was a little too clever by half. So part of what's interesting about the Google Books settlement uh, was that it was a big move that actually failed um, for some good reasons, but um, uh, it was sort of an effort to achieve a universal digital library, kind of, um, at least that would benefit the public and maybe authors and certainly Google. 
Uh, so Google, as uh, I'm sure you know, um, has digitized about 20 million books from mostly research library collections uh, around the world. About 3 million of those books are in the public domain. Uh, and um, 2 to 3 million of them are actually in copyright, but the publishers of those works are members of the Google Partner Program. And there's been a kind of negotiation between the publisher and Google about um, uh, how much of those books can be uh, made available through Google Book Search. Um, uh, uh, and there's shared revenues between the publishers and, uh, the, uh, and Google in respect of the, the, the Google Partner uh, Program books. There was a time when Google was imagining like shipping all the books in the world to the United States, scanning them there, and then making them available as part of Google Book Search. They went, estimated there are 174 million books in the world, um, and they were going to do it all, but now they're not. Um, okay. So what happened was that, you know, Google didn't have any books. Right? They had the money and they had the technology. The research libraries had the books and the desire to have mass digitization, but not the physical resources nor the technical um, sophistication to do uh, the kind of digitization uh, that Google had in mind. And so a deal was struck. Uh, and so the deal was that research libraries would give Google, just clear the shelves, give them the books. The, uh, Google would go off and scan the books. They'd return the books. and. In addition to getting the physical books back, the research libraries uh, made a deal that they get back digital copies of books that Google scanned from the research library collections. And this digital library known as HathiTrust is essentially the repository of uh, many, not all, but many of the, of the books that uh, were scanned from uh, research uh, library collections. So you can download for free all of the public domain books uh, that Google has as part of this. Uh, you can only see snippets of most of the, uh, of the works. Uh, and um, that's basically the access. Then there was this lawsuit. So a group called the Authors Guild that represents about 8,500 authors in the United States brought a lawsuit against Google for scanning the books, saying it's copyright infringement to scan those books and store them and process them uh, and serve up snippets in response to, um, uh, in response to search queries. Uh, and Google has defended this uh, on fair use grounds. Um, uh, the settlement was breathtaking. If you didn't study it, it's like, it would like take your breath away. It's really something amazing. So what happened was, this was a class action. It meant that all the authors and all the publishers who own all the rights in all the books in all the world, I swear to God, this is true, made a deal, um, uh, uh, this class made a deal with Google uh, in which it would have given Google the right to scan, uh, make non-display uses, that is the computational uses of all books in copyright in the world, um, and Google could commercialize all of them that were out of print uh, by selling institutional subscriptions uh, to a database of these books, selling individual books uh, in the cloud, and up to 20% of the contents of the books could be uh, available in response to search queries. Uh, so that would open up access to uh, tens of millions of books, potentially, um, and so it, that's why it was a kind of, and, and public libraries in the United States would be able to get access to uh, the institutional subscription database for zero money, at least one copy. Um, and so, wow, is that amazing or what? Um, and a new collecting society was going to be created called the Book Rights Registry. Uh, and, uh, and Google, for all the commercializations that they were going to do, would gather up the money and then throw 63% of it over the fence into the coffers of the Book Rights Registry. And then the Book Rights Registry would pay out money to authors uh, and other rights holders, depending on how much uses uh, were being made of the work. So it was um, a, a truly amazing thing. Would have had many benefits. Um, and I'm not going to go through them in interest of time. Uh, but before a settlement of a class action lawsuit uh, can proceed, uh, a court basically has to decide that it 
is fair, reasonable, and adequate to the class on, on whose behalf it was negotiated. And there were uh, hundreds of objectors uh, who were rights holders, uh, as well as the US Department of Justice and the governments of France and Germany were against it. Um, and I was too, um, uh, as, as was uh, Microsoft and Amazon.com. Uh, the settlement was rejected uh, in March of 2011. Uh, the judge hoped that it would go back into, uh, 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 that there would be a new settlement that he could approve of, uh, but the case uh, didn't settle um, at that time, and so it went back into litigation. Now, in the meantime, uh, the Authors Guild, not content with just suing Google, uh, decided that they were going to sue the University of California, the University of Michigan, most of the state universities that participated uh, in the Google Book project uh, and uh, made their books available for uh, scanning uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, to include in the corpus. Uh, and so um, the Authors Guild s claimed that the Haritas uh, corpus of 10 million books contained roughly 7.3 million infringing books and they wanted to get a judgment that would uh, then give an injunction to uh, essentially either uh, impound or possibly destroy uh, that corpus of uh, 7.3 million in copyright uh, books. And um, Anyway, the district judge, uh, um, the trial court decided that uh, Hattie Trust had made fair use and the Second Circuit uh, uh, affirmed that particular judgment. That case is actually settled within the last couple of weeks. Let me talk a little bit about fair use. It's like fair dealing a little bit um, in the UK, but it's broader in its scope uh, and it uh, covers a wider variety of situations. Uh, than uh, the fair dealing pri privilege of UK uh, law. So what does it say? What does the statute say? It says that fair use of a copyrighted work is not infringement. Uh, it identifies criticism, comment, um, uh, scholarship, teaching, research, and news as favored uses uh, that um, if you've done one of those, that actually tips in favor of uh, of fair use. Uh, there are four factors that are typically considered. Uh, the purpose of the defendant's use of the work, uh, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount and substantiality of the copying, and the harm or potential harm to uh, the market. Uh, and uh, this Campbell versus Sake of Rose decision uh, by the Supreme Court in the early 1990s has made whether something is a transformative use uh, into a really important part of the fair use uh, analysis. So the Campbell versus Acuff Rose case was a case in which uh, two live crew made a rap parody version of Roy Orbison's song, Pretty Woman, and it wasn't exactly a pretty song anymore. Um, it was raw, it was, uh, it was ugly, and it was uh, a little gross. Um, and uh, the Supreme Court said it's a parody, and a parody is a kind of critical commentary that weighs in favor of the use. And you were transforming the content of the work in a way that was now expressing a different uh, idea, and so that was something that was uh, uh, supported of uh, fair use. Um, conventionally, uh, something uh, is a productive use. If you quote from a particular, um, let's say, letter or poem or whatever that was um, uh, part of what you were studying in a biography that you were doing of someone. Uh, uh, in the most parts of the world, there would be a kind of fair quotation right for something like that. Uh, but um, productive uses like that are often uh, found to be fair uses in the United States. Um, and then there is sometimes when you use uh, something from a a copyrighted work that um, you're using it for a completely different purpose than the original, right? So when, um, when Abraham Zapruder like, was watching the Kennedy uh, uh, cavalcade in, in Dallas, Texas, he wasn't intending to capture the president's assassination, but it turns out that uh, when, um, when the president was assassinated, this was the only documentary evidence that was existed. And so when, um, 
uh, when an author wanted to uh, prove uh, or try to prove that, um, that in fact there was more than one killer of uh, the president, uh, he felt that he had to use that, uh, those images from the uh, uh, frames from the Zapruder film uh, and the court decided that that was fair use. Um, of course, that was a situation in which you created a second work, right? a new work that's a, an ongoing work of authorship, um, but you, ha you use the work for a different purpose. And the question that's been presented in some of these recent cases, especially the Hadi Trust and Google cases, is whether or not something can be a different purpose and be transformative even if you, um, you don't uh, create a second work. Uh, so uh, here's the kind of the short version of the, uh, the argument in the Hare Trust uh, case. So the Authors Guild basically said, look, Hare Trust has uh, made uh, copies, exact copies, of millions of works. And uh, it's systematic. Um, uh, so the amount copied, the purpose, and the nature all disfavor fair use in its view. And uh, while there hasn't been any harm to the market yet, um, there's a big risk that there will be harm to the market because who knows, Hadi Trust security might be weak, uh, and then all those in copyright books will get spilled over into the internet, it'll be kind of Napsterized, and that would be terrible. Um, and so um, uh, the argument is that it's unfair. Uh, but Hadi Trust actually said, no, 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 no. Let's look at it a completely different way. We're using these books for a very different purpose than, uh, than the original. Uh, we are preserving books for the future. Uh, we're broadening access for print disabled people. Uh, and we are um, uh, doing things that actually have different purposes than the original. So it's, it's definitely got to be good. 93% of the books in our corpus are actually nonfiction works. Almost all of them are actually out of print. Uh, written by scholars for scholars, and therefore not the kind of books that actually um, uh, uh, that um, people uh, wrote for money. And so even though the whole thing was copied, well, it's reasonable because if you want to create a full text searchable database, you basically have to do this, uh, and the harms to the market are speculative. The Second Circuit pretty much agreed with how to trust across the board. Um, so when it came to creating a full text searchable database, um, the Second Circuit panel said it's a quintessentially transformative use, even though a lot of people didn't think that was exactly right. Um, but um, that's what the Second Circuit says, so they're the bosses. Um, uh, all kinds of works were copied, but um, Google wasn't really discriminating based on uh, the type of the work. They just copied everything. Um, uh, so they copied whole works and isn't that terrible? No, it's not terrible because if you want to create a full text searchable database, you've got to copy the whole thing. That's actually essential uh, to it. Uh, and uh, in addition, um, Hadi Trust uh, couldn't, um, you know, had good security and the Office Guild admitted that there was no harm to the market to date uh, and they offered only speculation as to the future. And so um, the Second Circuit ruled in favor of Hadi Trust on that. Also, the, um, uh, as to print disabled access, they said, yeah, that's good uh, too. Um, so here's a place where they said, you know, the trial judge said that, that converting it from text that's printable to Braille is a transformation. And the Second Circuit said, no, it's not transformative. It expands the audience, but it's a non-transformative uh, use of the work, but that doesn't mean it's not fair. Uh, and so because of the public policies uh, that support making print disabled uh, people better able to have access to uh, those 10 million books, uh, that's actually a positive thing. So to see the 7.3 million that are in copyright, you have to identify yourself and have documentation that in fact you're a print disabled person. But then if you can, Hadi Trust will actually make the books available, right? Even the in copyright books available to, to print disabled people, which then gives them equal access to the print not disabled people who can pick up the book and, and open it up and read it. So it's actually not harming the market because uh, the, the publishers are in fact not serving that particular uh, market. Now, 
what are the implications of uh, the Hare Trust ruling for the Authors Guild v. Google case? Uh, almost everything is the same in this case. The two things that are different is that Google is obviously a commercial entity, um, but it's not commercializing uh, these, uh, these particular uh, books. Um, uh, it doesn't serve ads against them, for example, and in fact, um, uh, if a book is in copyright and they serve snippets of it, uh, they link to places where you can buy the book. So uh, uh, there is an argument that in fact uh, they, are, um, uh, they are doing authors a favor. Uh, and so snippets is a big difference. Uh, and so um, Google serves up snippets. Um, the district court decided that the Snippets were not going to supplant demand for the original, and that then meant that they were uh, that they were fair use in the judge's uh, view. Uh, and um, I have a brief uh, before the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in this case uh, on behalf of a new nonprofit organization I started uh, about a year ago um, called the Authors Alliance. And um, Authors Alliance basically made this argument in the brief. The overwhelming majority of the books that Google scanned uh, from research library collections are scholarly works written primarily to share knowledge, and most of them are out of print. Full text searchable database, such as Google Books and HathiTrust, actually means that people can find our books that wouldn't be able to find our books um, uh, otherwise. And discoverability that our books exist um, actually is something that um, is in furtherance of our interest uh, uh, and uh, a way to preserve the intellectual legacies of authors who write to contribute knowledge. The Authors Guild is seeking a $3 billion windfall uh, for copying books in which very few of their members actually own any uh, rights uh, and um, uh, also seeking to deprive authors like members of the Authors Alliance from having their books be discovered. Uh, so uh, the Second Circuit hasn't come down with a ruling on that case. Um, uh, we expect it um, pretty soon because it was argued in early uh, December. So I would expect before May we'll probably see a decision uh, in that particular case. Now, of course, there are controversies about Google Books in Europe also. Um, and Google has actually scanned a lot of public domain books from um, research library collections uh, here. Um, it was sued in Germany and in France. Uh, the court in Germany said the scanning, which would not be lawful in Germany, um, is being done in the United States. And uh, maybe it's an infringement of copyright in the United States. Maybe it isn't. Um, that's not for us to decide. But serving up snippets is actually not something that, uh, that uh, is a violation of German uh, copyright law. A French court found uh, scanning books in the United States actually to be um, uh, illegal, even if they were French books, uh, but that lawsuit was settled. Um, there have been a set of agreements that Google has entered into. Um, but one of the things that's interesting uh, is that the Google Books uh, project and the settlement kind of gave rise to some reactions here uh, in Europe, uh, including a memorandum of understanding uh, among author, publisher, and library representatives uh, so that uh, insofar as there are mass digitization of in-copyright works uh, in Europe, uh, they are to be done through uh, voluntary licensing uh, agreements uh, and not through kind of, shall I say, American-style gumption. Um, so, uh, collective management organizations will, uh, will participate in this and help to get remuneration to uh, appropriate rights holders. Uh, the UK has developed a really interesting uh, uh, framework for uh, making it possible to reuse orphan uh, work. So if there are one or a small number of works that you want to uh, digitize and uh, make available and you think that actually they are um, uh, they are uh, in copyright, but um, uh, orphans. Uh, you can engage in a diligent search to try to find the rights holder. You document that uh, you tried to search for them and you couldn't find them, and here's why. Uh, and then you can um, you can seek a license from um, the intellectual property office. Um, those are going to be non-exclusive licenses uh, for no more than seven years, although they can be renewed. Uh, and there are prices set for uh, the 
uh, availability of that license and the, the IPO will hold on to that money for uh, eight years and uh, if the rights holder shows up, they, the rights holder gets the money and if the rights holder doesn't show up, the IPO spends it on itself or on cultural activities. Um, uh, cultural heritage institutions have uh, a better uh, shot at making uh, works of a large number of works. Uh, if you have a box of documents that um, you don't know where they came from, you don't know who authored them, um, uh, special collections often have these kinds of things. Cultural heritage institutions, uh, as long as they um, uh, do the documentation about the, why these works are orphans, can use this without a license uh, to uh, have to pay. Uh, and extended collective licensing is now making its way into uh, the, um, uh, the uh, UK as well as into the Nordic countries um, to allow uh, some kinds of mass digitization types of efforts. In the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about extended collective licenses anymore because I kind of mentioned them a little bit earlier. They have some good things and they have some not so good things about them. Uh, I did want to talk about this one uh, case that came before the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union recently uh, whereby um, a German publisher objected to uh, uh, the, um, uh, a university in Germany having digitized uh, a book uh, that it owned rights in uh, and um, the Court of Justice was asked uh, whether or not uh, it was okay for a member states to allow libraries to digitize works in their collections to make them available for research and private study. Uh, and under the Information Society Directive, uh, the, uh, the CJEU decided that actually member states, as long as they've adopted the appropriate exception uh, under the InfoSoc Directive, uh, in fact can uh, do that digitization. And the court talked about there being a kind of ancillary right to digitize. So even though the InfoSoc Directive didn't talk about uh, there being a right to digitize to make works available, uh, the CJEU decided that actually uh, there was an ancillary right to digitize to make them available um, because that was the purpose of having that particular um, uh, exception be uh, available to member states of the EU. Uh, and the question then further was, okay, that particular exception allows the libraries or other cultural heritage institutions to display those works at dedicated terminals in uh, the facilities of that uh, institution. But what about downloading the contents of those works? What about um, printing out copies of some or all of their contents and again, the CJEU said, if, you, if the member state has adopted the appropriate exception, uh, that uh, they can, in fact, uh, make available downloads uh, or printouts, but these will require fair compensation uh, to the rights holder. And so uh, that was a, a bit of a victory for uh, the publisher. One other thing that CJEU said uh, in this opinion is that while um, uh, libraries uh, are able to digitize some of the works in their collection, mass digitizing the whole thing was not really in contemplation, and so um, uh, that could be dicta, but uh, I would be a little careful about that if I was trying to mass digitize in a lot of places in Europe. Uh, so um, in conclusion, uh, so uh, both in the US and also in the UK, um, we have strong interests in mass digitizing cultural heritage and increasing access uh, to uh, knowledge and culture for, for ourselves and also for future generations. Copyright is turning out to be a pretty big obstacle uh, to accomplishing uh, that, but there are ways to try to overcome uh, those uh, obstacles. Uh, fair use is pr proving to be uh, at least something of um, uh, a way to achieve uh, some mass digitization efforts. Um, uh, UK is going to be, I think, much more likely to do licensing as a way to achieve those objectives. Um, I'm actually, as part of the Authors Alliance uh, project, uh, one of the things we're trying to do is, especially for books that have been uh, out of commercial circulation for years, we want to get the rights back, right? Authors should be able to get the rights back if the 
If the publisher isn't making any money on it, we're not making any money on it. Uh, we make enough money every other year to take uh, our spouse out to dinner uh, and pay for their half, um, especially if we go to a cheap place. Um, uh, why shouldn't those works um, get reverted, right? Why shouldn't authors go ahead and try to get the rights back to the work and make them available through digital libraries or through their own self-publication efforts uh, because uh, we have an opportunity to do something really important for ourselves and for the future. And I hope we can find a way to try to overcome that. Um, Universal Digital Library is within reach. Let's try to go for it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Samuelson, for a very stimulating account of the problems to do with mass digitization uh, and copyright. We do have time for questions from the audience. So does anyone have a question? We have several people have questions. We'll bring the front. I, of course, couldn't agree more with the goal of having a universal digital library. But as a European, as always, I'm very worried about, so who owns the information once it's digitalized? And how is that protected? because I would really want it to be a public domain library and not a tool that then again closes off access and makes a lot of money and is not really universal nor accessible. So the cultural heritage institutions have to kind of step up and make that a priority. Um, it seems to me that a lot of them are. Um, they have the mission um, to serve the public interest by making information and culture um, more widely available, and so I think that they should take the leadership on that. I think that there have been some public policy endorsements of, uh, of that. I think, the, again, the endorsement of, um, of data mining as a, an important activity that can lead to new knowledge is something that, again, supports that particular thing. Um, uh, you know, I know that Google is not universally you know, uh, celebrated um, in Europe, but you know, they spent the money uh, to digitize the books, and um, all of the books that they copied from research library collections, they made those copies available to digital copies of all the works that they copied into those uh, research libraries. Um, some of them, uh, actually, uh, Stanford University has a, a digital library of the five million, roughly, books that uh, Google scanned from the Stanford collection, and they make those available only to people at Stanford. Uh, so the Hathi Trust is actually um, opening things up much more so that there are now, I think, roughly 100 um, uh, universities that are members of Hathi Trust, uh, and uh, anybody who is a researcher at the um, at, a, at an institution that's a partner of Hathi Trust uh, can have access to uh, the books that they can make the most access for, uh, and they have a real public, public interest-oriented thing. So just like Google, you can download books from Hathi Trust if they're in the public domain. Um, if uh, over time uh, that we're actually, the Authors Alliance is in uh, conversation with the officials of the Hathi Trust uh, um, uh, corpus, and um, we're trying to say that if we can help our, uh, our members and other authors to get their rights back, and they want to make those works available on a, under a kind of Creative Commons license, uh, then Hathi Trust will incorporate those books into the Hathi Trust corpus, uh, as well as they can be incorporated into the Internet Archives uh, corpus. So, um, you know, you're looking for leadership from uh, those institutions uh, because, you know, if it's just Amazon, Microsoft, Google, we know that they will make uses of them that are of their interest um, and not necessarily what's of interest to everybody else. Thank you. Uh, as a representative of the Digital Humanities Department, we'd very much like to thank you for the shout out. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. I just wanted to ask you, I mean, one of the interesting things that started coming up recently is there's the open annotation standard, which allows you to make a quote with all the correct metadata attached, which is absolutely wonderful for making quotations. 
But when Steve Jobs' autobiography came out, it had been quoted by so many people that, in fact, the entire work was available through many, many, many different quotes. Now, all those quotes in and of themselves were perfectly legal and correct and proper quotations. It was just en masse. They'd managed to digitize the entire book. So <laughs> I just wanted to have your opinion on where you think issues like that are going to lead in the future. Well, one of the things that we learn um, in our daily lives uh, now is that technology enables a lot of things that we didn't really plan on. Uh, and so part of actually uh, the conversation um, in a fair use uh, land um, is whether or not you can do enough searches uh, that you're basically reproducing the book. And um, the, the court was really very skeptical of that kind of argument in that particular case. Uh, but of course, a little bit depends on sort of what happens uh, and who's digitizing and how much security uh, they provide for, uh, for the content. Uh, so just because Potty Trust was able to show this security was strong enough and that no one had been able um, over the course of a decade uh, to, uh, to, uh, to loosen a book from uh, the corpus uh, was one thing that counted in favor of the fair use defense. And um, if Potty Trust has good security, I'm telling you, Google has really good security. So um, I'm not really expecting that those entities are going to cause big leakages, but of course, if people mass digitize and don't do as much to secure things, then um, that, could be, that could present a different situation. There's a question here. Um, I'd like to ask a question and make a comment. Um, you said, I think, that digitization is cheap by comparison with printing physical copies. But I had the impression from everything else that you said that you were only talking about books being digitized. And so the cost of printing is, in a sense, a part of the cost of digitization. Because if you start with a manuscript, you have to convert that into something that can be digitized. So it seemed to me that um, it wasn't actually a fair, com you weren't com comparing costs in a fair way. So that was, perhaps you could, you could elaborate on that. The, the comment that I wanted to make was in relation to the use of the term out of commerce. It's always seemed to me that that was um, a term of art used by publishers to put second-hand booksellers out of business. Because in point of fact, it's not the case that one can't find out of print work. Anyone who is interested in finding stuff only has to go on A Books to find that very small publishers who publish very small runs of books, and I speak as an ex-small book publisher, can still find that material in secondhand book sets. So fair, fair comments. Um, so if you already own a print copy, as libraries do, there's a certain cost actually to maintaining that physical copy in, um, in a library collection. And those costs are often uh, overlooked, but in fact they are quite substantial. Uh, and one of the things that libraries want to be able to do is both maintain their collections and grow their collections. So they are actually doing some now much more efficient ways of storing the physical books uh, in order to reduce the cost of the storage. Uh, but I was speaking really of the books and the works that are already in print form. And the question is, can you make a new one? Copyright's one obstacle, but if you're trying to make a physical artifact that is identical in content, that's actually expensive by comparison with the digitized uh, digitization, which can now be done um, at pretty high quality for a pretty modest uh, sum of money. 
um, and Internet Archive, I think, is like the leader on doing high quality preservation level uh, copies of works that uh, then uh, are done at a, at, a, at a reasonable cost. Now, the question about sort of what is an out of print, what is an out of commerce work, uh, is one that many people have conversations about. In, uh, in theory, nothing is ever out of print anymore. But one of the things that's happened uh, in uh, more recent contracts uh, involving books is that people basically have a definition of what's out of commerce or what's out of print uh, that actually takes into account um, whether ebooks are selling, whether EPUB uh, versions are selling, and it takes a, a certain quantum of sales uh, to say that the work is really uh, enough commercially available so that reversion rights don't attach. But authors have an, often an interest in getting back the rights in their books um, to make some uses of them that the publishers are basically not very interested in. That's what I'm really interested in. So three of our advisory board members for the Authors Alliance have actually, uh, with our help, been able to get their rights back. So uh, Katie Hafner, who's an independent writer, um, was really incensed because uh, the, her book uh, that she wrote in 2008 uh, about Glenn Gould and his romance with a piano um, was a work of love. And she had the insight that the people who would be most interested in buying it were people who don't do ebooks, like paperback. And so she, with our help, was able to get back the rights to make um, um, uh, the paperback versions of the thing, and it's selling again. Okay, so she had the intuition that that was really that the people who read ebooks they aren't my they aren't my audience. Um, uh, two others of our. Uh, advisory board members, we were able to get a right back. Publisher can still sell both ebooks and also print books, but Harold Barmus, Nobel Prize winner, uh, got the right back to put the book up on the internet for free for anybody who didn't want to buy the book. Um, and uh, Bob Darton, the uh, classics uh, professor and, um, uh, and librarian of Harvard University, we were able to get rights two of his books uh, back, and they're now going to be in the Hottie Trust Corpus and in the Internet Archive, um, available under Creative Commons license. So we're, we're, we're kind of surveying the landscape and trying to say, let's get more books available. Let's try to make something happen here. I think we have time for one more question. It's always been the case that some culture gets lost, okay? I'm not, I'm not saying that we're going to be able to preserve absolutely everything uh, because uh, some valuable parts of culture uh, basically pass away uh, as the people who um, kind of created that culture uh, pass away. And if the subsequent generations don't, um, don't appreciate it, if there hasn't been some archivist who basically collected that information, um, then it gets lost. So that's, um, uh, that's always going to happen. Uh, the question is, are we in fact going to take advantage of these opportunities? I will tell you one of the things that's uh, really motivating for me about this uh, Universal Digital Library project is I have a lot of students now. If it's not on the internet, it doesn't exist. Um, and um, you know, and so me, I grew up kind of going into the stacks and pulling books off the shelves, stuff like that, okay? Um, but that's not where my students are now. And to try to get them to do actual physical research in libraries and other kind of archival collections is really hard. They don't think it, it matters anymore. And so I'm worried that, you know, the, these libraries that have collected these millions and millions of artifacts. I mean, the University of California has spent $3 billion collecting books. You kind of sort of say, are students getting an, uh, the advantage of the $3 billion that the University of California has invested? I think the answer is not right now. Uh, so trying to sort of figure out ways to get more of those books accessible 
um, and accessible, at least initially, to the students and researchers at the University of California, hopefully more widely available than that, because the opportunity is really present. Thank you. Um, actually, I just have one final question, if I may. Uh, I know in your writing that you have supported the fair use solution in the US and also limitation on remedies, and that you've been critical of the Orphan Works Directive in the EU context. Which solution do you think should be adopted at the EU level, or are we right in just leaving it to member states? So I think that if you want to have um, a European Union, and I know this is a controversial subject here, um, <laughs> but if you want to have a European Union, like right now, everything is siloed, right? So the Orphan Works uh, directives are often aimed at sort of like, you can make use of this in the UK, right? It's an orphan work. Part of what the vision of the Orphan Works directive was that if it's an orphan work in one member state, it should be treated as an orphan work in all member states so that everybody can get access to it. Um, but in fact, there are lots and lots of silos, and especially the reliance on collecting societies uh, as the kind of entities to issue licenses, they are siloed by geography. So there's a real problem um, if you want to have a cultural heritage um, uh, initiative that reaches all across Europe, um, the silos that uh, are adopted, in fact, are, I think, an impediment. Now, I know that folks at the European Commission recognize this, um, and so um, hopefully they will find some way to uh, make it more available. But uh, I do know that there are uh, questions being asked, even at the Commission, about whether uh, Europe needs, if not fair use, because that's for our country, we don't like them, um, uh, that we need some sort of uh, way to build more flexibility into uh, European law. And a number of scholars in Europe have been exploring uh, what other mechanisms there might be to create some flexibility. Here's another argument for fair use. It's impossible for legislatures to figure out all the things that people could do with copyrighted works, OK? It's impossible for them to imagine what new technology is going to come along tomorrow um, and to make exceptions for every single one of them. So a big part of what fair use has been doing that's really been important in the United States is giving uh, a tool for balancing interests. Here is the purpose that the defendant is making. Is that a positive purpose that that is just a consumptive use that's, uh, that's uh, going to destroy the market for the work, OK? You take that into account. You take into account what kind of work it is how much did somebody take and how much harm is it causing to the market? That's something that you can apply in a lot of different kinds of situations. I would say that you know, Europe could adopt something like fair use and then have its own spin on it. So for example, a failure to uh, enable, a failure to identify the author of a work to give attribution could end up being something that uh, cuts against fair use here, whereas in the United States, we don't care about attribution, sorry. Um, and so um, uh, it just doesn't matter. If you don't give attribution, it doesn't matter. It doesn't count one way or the other. Um, in Europe, I think uh, moral rights issues would make it more uh, important that attribution be part of the, uh, part of the uh, calculus. So um, I just think you don't have, OK, so here's, here's something I said to the European Parliament. Um, it's fine with me if you adopt fair use, OK? I really like fair use. I think you could, you could benefit a lot for it, too. But you know what? If you don't adopt fair use, tough luck for you, because we are going to outcompete you in the marketplace, in the world, uh, because we have fair use and you don't. So take your choices. Watch this space. Um, well, I think that's an appropriate um, uh, note on which to close proceedings. Uh, we'd like to invite you to an, a, a drinks reception upstairs in chapters. You just exit the lecture theatre and go up the main stairs. There'll be a number of people to um, uh, direct you to the way of drinks. Um, but before we adjourn, if you could just thank me, uh, sorry, not thank me. <laughs> Join me in uh, thanking <laughs> Professor Samuelson. Thank you.